Good evening, my name is Diana Coppin, and I'm a member of the Historic Preservation Commission. Welcome to all of you in attendance tonight, along with those viewing via Facebook and SMU. For the month of April, we have had fascinating presentations about the history of our community. Much research has been done for each program, and many times, Braden Feline from the Clay County Heritage Center, as well as our friends at the library, have been instrumental in assisting with that research, and we thank them for that. This evening, our presenters will be Amanda Gloyd, the Marketing and Communi Community Relations Manager at, at SMU since 2009, along with Steve Peck, the General Manager and CEO of SMU since 2009. Prior to this, Steve served as SMU's Finance Manager. Amanda and Steve will be providing us with a history of Spencer Municipal Utilities dating back to the water utilities start in 1886, the purchase of the bankrupt for profit electric utility in 1901, and the addition of the communication utility in 1997. At the conclusion of tonight's program, we will have a question and answer section. To ensure that Amanda, Steve, and our viewing audience are able to hear your questions, we will bring a microphone to you to field your questions. And now let's give Amanda and Steve a warm welcome. <laughs> All right, well, we're glad we're able to get started here. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, to start off with, we thought it would be important to talk about the history of Spencer and when Spencer started. And so in May 8th, 1871, that's when Spencer was first platted. Um, and so we thought it would be important to know that before we get into the history of SMU. Another date that's kind of interesting is that Spencer's first city hall was built in 1883. So several years after the first plat in town is when city hall actually got built, the first city hall. So in 1886, that is when a group of people here in Spencer decided that they wanted to have water service. And so they established waterworks at that time. They had a large well, it was a very deep well, about 400 feet deep. They had a wind pump and a wooden water tower. And so that was located on the lower end of Main Street. So is the area that we believe is a laundry mat now, just north of the bridge on Grand Avenue. So that's where that water tower was located. And it cost about $3,000 to put in back in 1886. So in 1891, the community was starting to want electricity. So several individuals formed an electric light plant. They pulled together $8,000 and built the first electric light plant in Spencer. So then on Friday, February 17th, 1897, that first water tower in Spencer burnt to the ground. It was a wooden water tower. Um, and so they ran into some different difficulties during that time. One of them was the closest fire hydrant was frozen, so that wasn't working out well. Um, the next closest fire hydrant, that one, um, the fire hose wasn't long enough. They didn't have a long enough fire hose at that time to reach. And so um, eventually the water tank burnt down. It was a wooden water tank, uh, but it was also located in that area, what was known as the rink here in Spencer. And it was a recreational area, a roller skating rink, kind of the place where everybody came to town here in Spencer. And so as that water tower, um, they were looking like they were not gonna be able to fight that fire. They started taking out chairs, furniture, anything they could out of the rink to try to save that. Uh, but eventually that wooden water tower came down on the rink. Um, no one was injured in that fire. Um, but it was kind of devastating to the community because they were concerned about their water source as well as the rink where they all came to hang out. Um, and so if you are a Spencer history buff, you probably are thinking about when the fire, the big fire was in Spencer. This was before that. So um, that fire in Spencer was in 1931. So just to put that into perspective there with that fire. And then the picture in this, uh, on this slide um, is the water tower that replaced the wooden water tower. We did not find any pictures or anything of that wooden water tower. So a couple of interesting things on here. When we think today about a fire hydrant being frozen, um, so today our hydrants drain naturally. So when the fire department turns the valve on, they fill with water, they fight the fire, they turn the valve off, the hydrants drain themselves. We have a few old hydrants that don't, but most of our self drain so they don't freeze. And then the uh, issue with the hose being long enough. So today we work hand in hand with the fire department. 
There are building codes on how far a hydrant has to be from the next hydrant. That's not necessarily drawing a circle around the hydrant because it's travel distance for the truck. So they would hook the hose onto the hydrant and start driving the truck. So if it's not a straight path, that 600 feet radius doesn't work. So that's something we work a lot with in new developments and with the fire department to make sure we have enough hydrants for fighting fires in town. So some more facts on early electric light plant. In 1894, the group of investors had to put in some more money. They put another $6,000 in, and then later in years, they put in another 11,000 to get to a total investment of 25,000. In 1897, they started to experience financial troubles, and they had total debts of $10,700, which today seems like a really small amount of money. But that led to a sheriff's sale, and the light plant was purchased by First National Bank. The bank owned it for several years, and then in 1901, the city of Spencer purchased it for just under $16,700. And if my internet search was right, that's about $402,600 today. So in 1912, that's when the first steam engine was uh, put in place here in Spencer. That replaced the oil generators at that time. And then uh, we continue to work on generation equipment to meet the community needs. That was something that continued throughout history and still continues today. So then in the 1930s, that's when the new power plant um, was constructed here in Spencer. In that top picture there, you'll see it was the power plant, the, water, the new water tower in town, um, steam, everything was right there. And that is similar to the area where we were located before we moved to our location now. So in the 712 Grand Avenue area, that is where that was. Um, also, that picture on the bottom there, there's kind of a moat area from what I understand that is similar to the area where that fountain is uh, between the bank and the police station today. So um, you can see there's not a lot of houses in that area at that time. So here are some rates back from Nar March of 1941. You can see we had a fairly complicated rate structure depending on what you were using electricity for that fluctuated what your rate was that you were paying for electricity. In 1942, the community voted to move the utilities from the city of Spencer to a separate board of trustees. So the first three trustees were Randall Tuttle, E.P. Arnold, and Dale Norton. A couple of those names you recognize, uh, big contributors to Spencer. So to this day, our board members are appointed by the mayor and approved by the city council. And I probably should point out we have a fact checker here and a former board member, Tom Howe, who was on the board for several years in the early 2000s. Um, in the late 1940s, that's when the new water plant was built on the east side of Spencer. So that was in the 10th Avenue East area, south of the Pedersen Park area. Um, that was when it moved from 712 Grand Avenue, so it moved out to the east side of Spencer. Um, also at that time is when we started softening water in 1959, so we've been softening the water here in Spencer for a number of years. And then also in 1959, that is when the North Water Tower was constructed, so that's the one that's still there today, uh, north of the North Gateway Mall. In 1960, the utilities built an office building on Grand Avenue. So previous to that, um, if you're familiar with that area, just south of that building, there's a little brick building that's maybe 20 by 20. That's where all of the utilities employees met in the morning before they went out to do their job, and that was the manager's office before this building was built in 1960. A um, Couple fun facts about this building. Uh, the driveway all around it was heated. So in the winter time, they would heat the driveway to melt the snow and ice. And the other thing, uh, we were the first business in town to have two drive-up windows. Did you know that? That building had two drive-up windows. Uh, we were a little different than the fast food restaurants. We just took money at both windows. We didn't have anything to give out at the second window. Then in the 1960s, that's when we began receiving hydroelectric power. And so that at that time was from the Bureau of Reclamation, and it's now known as WAPA today, um, which we still get hydropower from today. And we'll learn more about that later on here. So back in the 1960s, that contract was for about four megawatts of power. Uh, today our peak is 34 in Spencer, 
and our contract with WAPA today, depending on the month, is between 16 and 19 megawatts, depending on the month. In 1965, Spencer, along with several other communities, banded together to form the North Iowa Municipal Electric Cooperative Association, or NIMECA. The group exists to share power supply resources. Um, some of us peak in the winter, some peak in the summer, so the group shares all of our resources. We own all of our own assets, so most power supply groups that exist like this, the power supply group owns the asset, the utility signs a contract with the power supply group, we're different. We've actually bought our resources and we commit them to NIMECA and the partnership and then we balance that on an annual basis. Then in 1969, that is when the jet turbine generator was installed here in Spencer. Um, one of the reasons that was installed was for reliability. There were some big storms here in the community, and so the board wanted to be able to have a reliable source um, if we were not able to get power to the community. They wanted to be able to power the community um, in any type of weather. You can see in that picture in the background, there's some stacks and infrastructure that was still in use when the steam turbines were generating downtown, and those go away, and obviously those aren't there today. Then in the 1970s, SMU invested in Neil 4 Generating Station near Sioux City, and we've got eight megawatts um, there. Also in the 1970s and 1971, the South Water Tower was constructed just south of Asher Motors, 750,000 gallon tank, and I think Mr. Chennault still has a hammer from when the crew built that tower. So that's a fun fact. Um, also in the 1970s, the water plant was moved from the east side of Spencer out to the west side, west of Stalley's, or south and west of Stalley's, and the cost of that new plant was just under $682,000. Then in the 1980s, that's when we began moving electric service underground. Again, one of the reasons for that was for reliability. With storms that were coming to town, they wanted to be able to have reliable power here in Spencer. Also for aesthetics, it helped make our community look a lot nicer with having all those power lines underground. Um, also in the 1980s, that's when we discontinued generating electricity due to the ownership in Neil 4. So also a benefit of being underground is our increase, Amanda mentioned reliability, we just have so many fewer problems being underground than we do overhead. In addition to all the visible impacts, just keep in mind when you drive through another community, all that stuff you see hanging from poles is all buried here. So when we do work underground, we have a lot of stuff to work around. In the 1980s, that's when the steam turbines were retired from service, um, and then the steam tunnels were purchased by the electric utility. And actually, the first um, jet turbine here in Spencer that's known as the Sleeping Giant, that is currently located in Waverly. If you ever are in that area, you can stop by and see that. This was supposed to be my slide. I flubbed up. So our steam heat utility sold the last steam in September of 1988. So previous to that, when the turbines ran at 712 grand, that steam was fed from the turbines uh, from the basement of that building to the alleys north and south of Grand that still exist today. That did come to an end in 1988. The economics of generating power wasn't there at a scale that we were doing it, so we shut that down. In an effort to help those businesses downtown, we offered low interest loans to help them convert to a more traditional form of heating to replace what they lost with the steam turbine going away. Our telecom history dates back to 1995. In that year, the Iowa Communications Network was looking at um, building fiber to all of the school facilities in Spencer as part of the ICN network. Uh, the utilities board worked with the school and we, we issued or we offered a zero dollar bid. So SMU installed the fiber to the school facilities uh, for no cost in 1995. We saw early on the benefit of having connectivity to our school facilities and having the learning experiences that kids would have. So we started in 95. We also um, connected all of our substations at that point in time. 
In 1997, the Act Now campaign started to form a municipal telecom utility. It was a volunteer-driven effort to um, get into the, really what drove that back then, 20-some years ago, was television. And people didn't like some of the channels that we didn't have, so uh, that drove us to go to a public referendum, and it passed with a 91% approval. So we started designing and doing feasibility studies, and then in 1999, after all of those proved to be favorable, um, construction began building the hybrid fiber coax system in town. In 1998, that's when the wellhead protection plan was put in place, and this was for water. So it's in the area out by the Spencer Airport, and this is a program that's in place with the city of Spencer and SMU, and it protects the area of land above the aquifer where we get our water. So it's important to protect it from different man-made threats, and so it protects um, the area that it can travel um, underneath into that aquifer for about 10 years. It can take up to 10 years to fill up that aquifer. So we cover that land out there just to help keep our water safe. Um, and as I mentioned, um, our water comes from an alluvial aquifer. It's the Little Sioux Ocheden Aquifer. And we've got eight wells out by the Spencer Airport. Um, and those are considered shallow wells because they're all less than 100 feet deep. So if you remember back the first well in town for the first water, that was 400 feet deep. That was pretty deep compared to what we have today. Um, and just to give you an idea for treatment, we uh, treat about 1.3 million gallons on average uh, today. We do peak quite a bit higher than that in the summertime when people are watering lawns and swimming and using a lot of water outside. Um, we get quite a bit above that. Um, but then also for distribution, we maintain about 100 miles of pipe throughout the community of Spencer. This is a picture of where our wells are located. Uh, as Amanda said, we have eight wells. We did, we've moved around a little bit out there, but we've had eight wells for quite a while. Um, the last two we retired were right at the corner of 18th Street and 32nd Avenue, and we moved them further out, in, further west into the airport property, so they'd be the two west of that runway. Um, all of those wells are very shallow. So that's why wellhead protection is critically important. Once something happens to the aquifer, there's, there's no fix to it. So it's something that we have to take very seriously to protect. Then in 2000, we did some upgrades to the water treatment plant, um, and that was just to meet DNR standards. So we spent about $2 million to do some upgrades then. We did um, add the second contraflow at that time, and then we also enclosed the contraflows for the first time, which means putting the roof over top of those. So um, that was just some minor upgrades that we did to the water treatment plant back in 2000. Did you know that prior to that, your drinking water was in an outside tank that birds would fly over and do their thing? That's kind of amazing, and in the water quality world we live in today, that's really not that long ago when our water was um, in an open tank before sending it into the system. So our telecom after construction took a couple of years. As I said, it began in 99. In the fall of 2000 is when we started hooking up cable TV customers. Uh, you can see the Switches On logo down there. We had the Switches On campaign. We had charter subscribers that uh, if they signed up as a charter subscriber, they got their first two months of TV free. So with hookups in the fall, the first bills actually went out in December of 2000 for cable TV service on SMU. In the spring of 2001, we began offering high-speed internet service. Originally, we partnered with four ISPs or internet service providers to do that. Um, later, as they started to slow down, we entered the market, and today we're the only ISP on our system. I think the switch is on campaign. I think I still have some leftover bumper stickers around the office, so several people were driving around with those on their car at that time. This is part of the fun part of being in the communication business programming agreements with programmers like ESPN and Fox and all of the other channels that we carry. So back in 2000, when we put MTV on as an example, we had a contract with MTV to do that. Today, 
Um, all of those companies have consolidated, and every contract we have covers at least five, up to eight, or maybe sometimes more than that channels. And to take one today, we take all. So we don't have um, any negotiating power on what channels we have in that group. If we have one, we take everything they're going to give us. And the other thing we have very little control over is rates. So uh, we do partner with the National Content and Technology Cooperative. They're a, a U.S.-based company, or a U.S. They serve the entire U.S. And small companies like us partner with them to negotiate programming deals um, as a group rather than individually. And with our last cable rate increase that just went into effect, 90% of that cable TV rate is going to pay programmers. None of that money stays in town to operate our system. So that $120 bill, $12 of that is what we keep and operate our system on. <clears throat> when we started doing communications, we, of course, uh, implemented the Spencer Channel 3. And that's a great benefit to the community of Spencer. We cover lots of different things that happen in Spencer, whether it's different community events or Spencer Tiger Athletics. And so there's lots of things that we do. I think we've got all of our staff out tonight on different activities. Um, but we cover all that stuff, and then we broadcast it on the Spencer Channel 3 one of the things we had to do in 2020, we all know what happened in 2020 with COVID, um, is we had to adapt. And so we have the Spencer Channel 3 webcast now as well. You can get there through our website. Um, so it's just another way for people to be able to see that programming live um, if they're not able to make it to the event or they're not uh, feeling like they can make it or for whatever reason, they can still tune in and see it there. Um, so that's one of the things that we did there just to keep moving forward with our programming on Channel 3. So telephone service came a little bit later. There was a telephone switch that we had to install, and we had to get all of our interconnections with Quest and the PSAP locally, the 911 center. Uh, so we offered our first telephone lines in the summer of 2002, and that's if you wanted a brand new 580 phone number. Um, in our case, 580-5800. And then the following spring in 2003, we had local number portability available, so if you were a Cent or a Quest customer back then, you could bring your existing phone number over and still become an SMU customer. So if you think about it, back in that time when we first started offering telephone and we had that 580 prefix, everybody had their phone numbers in the telephone books, everybody knew phone numbers. No one wanted to get a new phone number because that was kind of a big deal. So once we were able to start porting numbers in the spring of 2003, um, from what I understand, there were times we had lines of people out the door just wanting to come and get their service with SMU and keep their phone number. That bottom picture there is our TV tower that sits at Country Villa uh, mobile home park. So we built that also in the year 2000 to receive all of our programming off-air channels. And then we had three satellite dishes behind the building at 712 where we received that signal. 2003 and 2004, the downtown streetscape project happened. Um, SMU was a major partner in that with the city of Spencer. Uh, that was the entire basically building to building renovation of sidewalks and street lights and the speaker system was installed. All the trees were replaced at that time and that was a really big undertaking being right on grand with the amount of infrastructure that had to be uh, worked around and renewed underground. So that was a, a great project. To continue with communication services, in 2006, that's when we announced a partnership with Evertech to bring iWireless cellular service to Clay County. And so then um, in 2007, that's when we were able to start signing up customers for the first time with iWireless. In 2007, Walter Scott 4 near Council Bluffs came online, SMU is about a 1% owner in that, and that gives us 8% or 8 megawatts of our capacity that we need in town. Some of the economic development activities that we do, one of the big ones was the storefront initiative that happened from 2007 until 2009. We had 142 projects completed during that time frame, and they were all storefront renovations, so all of those um, Pictures there are buildings that were renovated as part of that project. So we granted a little over a million dollars in both grants, and then we also paid the interest on the loans up to 25,000 for 10 years, and that leveraged a private investment of over $5 million during that time frame. 
So that really improved the appearance of a lot of different businesses in our town at that time. But also, if you think back to that time, um, things were kind of slow for contractors. So it was great keeping a lot of them employed and giving them jobs to do um, that were really benefiting the whole community during that time. In 2009, we partnered again with the city to buy the land and develop the infrastructure to form the Green Industrial Center. So out there we have Pioneer, we have Spencer Ag Supply, uh, MWI, Black Hills Energy has a facility out there, and obviously we have some lots for sale. Uh, this actually is an employee photo we took out there several years later, uh, just at one of the entryway signs when you enter the Green Industrial Center. In 2009, that's when we updated the street lights North Grand. So that was from 7th Street North. Um, and then those were some of the first LED street lights that we put into town here. So um, you'll, everyone notices those when they go through town. Today, that's all we do is LED. So this was kind of a pilot project, and they've been very reliable, and they worked well. So every street light we put in now is LED. Another thing that happened that's a big deal for economic development, in 2009, SMU was approved to participate in the USDA Rural Economic Development Loan and Grant Program. That's a program where a nonprofit entity can apply. Uh, there's an application process that uh, SMU helps the applicant with, and also our partner, Iowa Area Development Group, helps us submit those grants, grant requests to USDA. It's a maximum grant of $300,000. SMU matches that with 60000 The nonprofit gets to borrow that $360,000 at 0% interest for 10 years. So we have done five projects so far. Uh, the City of Spencer Comp Center when it moved to 712 Grand, Autumn Center on East 5th Street, the Early Childhood at Center in, at Sacred Heart, the Education Center at Oneota, and currently the Iowa Lakes Corridor Spec Building is a project that we're working on. And those last two, actually, both SMU and Iowa Lakes Electric Co-op uh, wrote grants for. So both of those projects got $720,000 in 0% interest financing. When those funds are repaid to SMU or to Iowa Lakes, they stay in our local revolving loan fund. And then we have a local board that determines uh, what projects those dollars get loaned out to, basically to grow, grow the economy and, and retain and build workforce here in town. In 2013, that's when we began the first phase of Fiber to the Home. Um, a year or so before that, our board decided to move forward with expanding to Fiber to the Home here in Spencer. And so we started that in 2013. We did it over several different phases. I think there were four phases throughout Spencer. Um, a little while later in 2020, that's when we began Ultimate TV Service, and that's our new IPTV service um, that doesn't use the coax cables. Um, and then in 2021, that's when we finished the final phase of Fiber to the Home. So when you look at that timeline, um, we were nearly finished with Fiber to the Home construction in 2020 when COVID hit. And so we were really uh, quite prepared here in Spencer for a lot of work from home and different things that we all had to do during that time uh, because we were just near finishing up um, the final phases there of Fiber to the Home. In January of 2014, SMU moved from 712 Grand to 522nd Avenue East, the former Perry Judd's facility. Uh, we bought it really, really cheap, and we've spent quite a bit of money investing in it and making it ours and making it functional. So one of the big benefits of this facility is today, things that we didn't even think about 10 short years ago, all of our equipment is inside at night, not only vehicles, but all of our vehicles have laptops in them, they have iPads in them, they have locators in them. So we have a lot of high dollar equipment in all of our equipment that is now in a climate controlled building. We also, previous to this move, we stored a lot of our transformers and switch gear outside. So they were being exposed to the elements before we even deployed them into service. So uh, just a great benefit of moving into that facility, making it functional for us. And obviously another benefit was the police department found a new home on Grand and that led to uh, the Farmer's Bank expansion also. When we talk about having all of our equipment in our office and under the roof, um, 
it really helps us out with improving our reliability in town when we've got outages because before in the middle of winter we'd have to dig around in the snow and find the right transformer to be able to go out and fix that so now they're all inside um, we can easily see our inventory and pull what we need to do and it just speeds things along during outage situation situations So in 2014, we started a multi-phase significant improvement project at our water treatment facility. We had a capacity issue and we had a safety related to chemical feed issue that we needed to address. So we, we began with phase one and you see the little building on the left there, that sits right west of Stolly's. That's our emergency pump station. So in the event we lost the water treatment facility, we would be able to pump water to the community through that facility, it would be chlorinated, um, but it would not be softened. So the soft water we're used to, we wouldn't get in an event like that. Um, but we have a lot of redundancy built in the water plant too. So hopefully that never happens. In 2014, our WAPA contract was extended and that's for the hydropower that we get here in Spencer. And of course, we're always planning ahead, so that was the contract for 2021 to 2050. And that means that our capacity rights were extended through 2050. That has nothing to do with rates. So every year the government goes through a rate setting process, it's a public process uh, with a comment period, and then the rates are set on an end. They don't necessarily change every year, but they go through the process every year. In October of 2015, SMU joined the Southwest Power Pool. You can see the map there. That's parts of 14 different states that we uh, are a member of now. That means that we turned our transmission assets over to them and they control and operate our transmission system. So from a maintenance standpoint, because our transmission system is now part of the bulk system, we have to do scheduling and take outages two weeks in advance because the system's relying on those assets to deliver electricity. Continuing with our water history, in 2015, that's when we started the second phase of the water treatment plant updates. Um, and then in 2017, a couple years later there, we finished that final phase. Um, and then we were wrapping up different construction things. So then in August of 2017, that's when we were able to have a ribbon cutting and grand opening out at the water treatment facility after it had all of the updates. So in 2000, we put a roof over the contraflows. In 2015, we put them inside of a building, which has been a huge, huge improvement from an operational standpoint, a safety standpoint. You can see how tall those tanks are. There used to be catwalks between the tanks under an aluminum roof and in the winter time with water constantly flowing and the condensation issues, there were a lot of um, not ideal safety situations out there in the winter time. So this is a much, much better water treatment plant today. And we also increased our capacity with a lot of redundancy throughout the construction when we did all those updates as well. So that's great for us moving forward. In 2019, we made the decision and moved from our previous billing provider to NISC, or the National Information Solutions Cooperative. They're a company that's very heavy into electric utilities, um, especially RECs. We looked at a couple of different options. This one really rose to the top because they not only do utilities, they also do communication services. So part of this upgrade allowed us to have outage management. Um, it allowed us to have a Smart Hub app so people could get data on their account, pay their bills and so forth. It greatly expanded the different payment options we had for people to pay their bills. And it also provided some uh, remote tie-ins to our SCADA system from an operational standpoint. In 2020, um, we replaced the South Water Tower and so then in 2021, that water tower was decommissioned. And the reason that we had to replace it was there was some ice built up and it structurally wasn't safe anymore. So we needed to replace it. And I think Glenn's got a hammer from this tower being built too. <laughs> so we're really proud of the green energy portfolio we have. In May of 2021, we had our newest wind farm that we buy output from come online. 
previous to this, we had two wind contracts that were about 8% of our load. Uh, Willow Creek takes us up to 24%. It's a wind farm located near Rapid City, South Dakota. And because of our membership in the Southwest Power Pool, we can transport that energy over their system and get it, get it home. And in addition to that, WAPA today is about 50% of our kilowatt hours, and that's all hydropower and considered green. So as a, as a percentage, we have a really high percentage of green energy in Spencer. So shortly after that, we made the other half of our billing conversion and took our communications products over to NISC. So that allowed us to get both bills in one envelope. Um, it allowed us, our customers, access to the same payment channels we added. And it also, uh, not customer facing, but internally it does a lot of auto provisioning. So when we say that Steve signed up for expanded basic TV, behind the scenes provisioning that we used to do manually automatically happens, so it saved a lot of staff time. It also um, created a lot of the same payment channels with being able to pay your communications through the app, um, some of those things that we weren't able to do when we first converted, but um, once we were fully integrated, we had all of those options. In 2023, just last year, about this time, actually late April, we went to uh, engineer, Ian, engineering and operations conference and we were awarded the Reliable Public Power Provider designation. So that's an award that American Public Power gives out to utilities that demonstrate excellence in workforce development, safety, reliability, and system improvement. So we spent a couple of months going through the process of filling out the questionnaire and providing the information to the review team that we thought we met that designation. And then in, uh, I think it was May 1st actually, we were granted that uh, the first time in our history that we were designated as an RP3 provider. It's a designation that's good for three years. Um, it's a testament to the work that we do on a planning standpoint and it's the work that our employees do every day to maintain our system. This last winter, we started upgrading our electric meters to AMI meters, so we started that um, this last winter, and we're finishing it up. We've got the last few left here to do this spring, but this has been um, one thing that will improve um, the knowledge that customers will have on their usage, so we'll be able to make decisions based on your usage because you can log into Smart Hub with your new meter and take a look at your more details about your usage. The other big benefit of this system and these meters is that when they don't have power, we know they don't have power. So it corresponds back to us at our main office and we know we have an outage because that meter doesn't have power anymore. So this is some information about kind of the current status of our electric utility. Uh, currently we have a 34 megawatt summer peak and a 33 megawatt winter peak. Uh, we get resources from those um, generation sources to meet those peaks. We have a 20 megawatt hydro contact with WAPA. We own about 1% of Neil 4 and Walter Scott 4, which are both coal plants. Uh, we have the downtown jet generator that's a 20 megawatt unit. We do at least 10 megawatts of that to Corn Belt and have since uh, it came online, so they've helped us pay for that unit. Uh, we also lease from them uh, five megawatts of Wisdom 2, located west of town. And then the balance comes from our agreement with NIMECA, and our purchase agreement for wind energy is actually with NIMECA. So we have, uh, as we've mentioned, joint ownership in two coal plants, uh, one at Sioux City and one at Council Bluffs. Mid-American is the primary owner and operator, but because of that ownership, uh, when those plants were built and the transmission lines that were built to serve those plants, we, we also have an ownership interest in. So we, we own quite a few miles of transmission jointly with Mid-American. And the second bullet point there is we also have an undivided interest in Corn Belt Power's common transmission system. So we own an undivided interest in over 1,600 miles of transmission around really a little bit bigger than the northwest fourth of the state of Iowa. Um, our interconnection to the grid, we have three different points of interconnection around the community at 69,000 volts. So in the event 
of a tornado hitting one side of town, we should be able to deliver power from the other side of town. This is just some rate information. Um, the top left is the American Public Power Survey based on 2021 data. Uh, APPA surveys all the utilities in the country, and they put a report out, and you can see that SMU was at 8.3 cents, uh, public power in Iowa was at 8.4, and you can see the other numbers there. So we're really proud of the rates we have um, and the reliability that we have. Bottom left is water. Our water rates are quite a bit higher than, than we'd like, candidly. Um, the reason for that is we have a really new water plant that we're still in the process of paying for. So as other towns start to invest in infrastructure like we did several years ago, they will uh, start to see some of those rates as well. As an example, the 16, about 16 million we spent on our plant, um, currently Milford is getting ready to build a new plant up there and their plant is uh, north of $30 million and it's smaller than ours was. So we built at the right time. And then the right side is our communication rates. Um, I think everybody realizes that when SMU entered the market in 2000, uh, TV got a lot more cheaper in Spencer because there was competition. And that's something that, that has continued. And if you survey rates in surrounding communities, TV and internet is substantially cheaper in Spencer because we have competition. Um, just some information on our internet service today. We have multiple speed options up to a gig. Of course, we didn't offer a gig when we started, uh, but we've got residential as well as business packages available. And then one of the things we pride ourselves on is the in-house tech support. So you can call in and you can talk to someone right here locally um, to be able to help you through your tech support issues. Some history of the internet. We started offering service at the six meg level. Uh, we increased to 10 meg a couple years later and currently we're at 250 meg as our base package. So as a community, our bandwidth continues to grow. Um, our biggest bandwidth days are days when there's no school <laughs> in the winter time and kids are doing a lot of studying when they're at home. <laughs> We're part of Mutual Aid for Electric and Communication Services. Um, we're actually the hub here for Northwest Iowa, but we work with municipal utilities throughout Iowa for the mutual aid program, and so that's so that we can help each other out wherever there's a disaster or need arises. So um, several years ago, we did send some uh, staff down to Hurricane Irma to help with uh, mutual aid there. Also, that top picture there is just Sibley, not too far away from here, but they had a bad ice storm one April, um, so we were able to help out there. But that's something that we coordinate with all of the municipal utilities around us. So if we are sending crews out, uh, they are not, so that we're all able to work together and back each other up if something were to happen. Uh, we, we actually have two people on our staff that coordinate the electric and um, communications mutual aid for Northwest Iowa. Another thing that comes into play if we deploy resources that far away from home, um, equipment. So we have a great working relationship with Milford. We'll make sure that if our Digger Derrick truck goes, theirs doesn't. Or if their bucket truck goes, we make sure both of ours are here so we can help them out at home if they have an issue while our people are away helping others. This is kind of a snapshot of our current customer count or statement count, I should say. Um, electric and water, we send out about 6,600 statements. And with communications, we send about 4,900 statements. So SMU and the community, um, economic development's a big part of what we do. Um, our, our territory is fixed, so we want the community to grow also, and, and our board philosophy for a long time has been if the community is successful, the utilities will be successful. So some of the things that we do, um, SMU is exempt from property tax as a municipal utility. So to make up for that, we send the city money every year for lieu of tax, and that's been about $625,000 a year that goes into the city's general fund to offset property taxes. Uh, we belong to Iowa Area Development Group. We belong to the Iowa Lakes Corridor, uh, Spencer Area Jobs Trust, Spencer Economic Development Corp, Spencer Chamber, I'm probably missing a few. We partner a lot with economic development entities in town, partner a lot with the city. 
Uh, we've been a big player in housing initiatives, uh, which started with Stony Brook many years ago. And since that, we've done a couple more rounds of funding to incentivize home building in town. And really, what started the Stony Brook subdivision was the big employers saying, we have a problem finding places for our people to live. And that hasn't gotten any better in the 15 years since we've done Stony Brook. This is our employee photo we take every year in August or September. So this is last September. Um, everybody there is wearing an RP3 t-shirt. That's what we celebrated last year. So we have uh, 46 full-time employees and one part-time employee in local programming. We have a really diverse group of people at the utilities. Our linemen are certified by the US Department of Labor. There's a program they go through to receive their card. Um, our water operators are certified by the Iowa Department of Natural Resources, so they have continuing ed they have to keep up with. We have communication technicians, we have IT staff, uh, customer service, we have a leadership team, we have uh, operations support, we are staffed 24 seven. So we have people that work a rotating shift, so we always have somebody at the facility. Uh, finance and accounting, did I miss anybody? I hope not. So we have a great, great group of people, and a lot of times I think every one of the people in those pictures go home and they don't realize the impact they have on this community every day. Obviously, we had a snafu getting the feed going on, but the lights were on, the toilets were flushing, <laughs> internet was good, so reliability is a big deal in our world. And if we're doing our job, you forget about us because you don't have a reason to call us. So a couple other things that I want to talk about before we open it up for questions. So that's kind of our history. Um, so we started um, as a community with a municipal utility that invested $3,000 to build a well and some water equipment. Today we have $163 million of utility plant and service that provides electricity, treats and delivers water, and delivers internet and cable TV. Last year we were just under $30 million in revenue, um, and we still, on the electric side, have some very competitive rates. Communication side, we have competition. We've been able to help hold those rates down. Um, water, we're in front of the curve. We'll get there when everybody else catches up. So a couple things future-wise. We didn't talk at all about EVs in here. So electric vehicles are something that you hear a lot of press about, you see a lot of press about. Uh, we bought one a couple of months ago, so we're, we're testing, we're training, we're seeing what we can learn. Uh, we want to be educated. We want to give good information when people start talking about buying an EV. So we're, we're on the front end of that process. One of our communication vans is, is an electric van. Uh, we talked about our green energy portfolio. Uh, we have a huge percentage of wind right now. We are looking currently at our second solar project, the first one uh, was slightly ahead of COVID and prices just weren't where we wanted them to be, so we passed on that one. Uh, we think solar will certainly play a role. Solar in the summertime is great for us because it matches our peak when the sun's shining. Um, our peak days are the hottest, stillest days when the wind necessarily isn't blowing. So solar would fill that gap and give us some options in terms of uh, future energy sources. The other thing that we talked about was our standby generator downtown Spencer, installed in 1969. Uh, they were used jet engines when they were put in. They've been well maintained, um, but it's sort of like a collector car. It's kind of hard to find parts for 1969, anything. So we are exploring and have been for several years now what the replacement will be, what that looks like. Uh, most likely that will be a dual fuel unit of some sort, diesel and natural gas, so we can uh, serve the community from a reliability standpoint. And also units like that have value on the market today um, because of the changing environment in the electric industry. Having an asset like that allows us to price that into the market and dispatch it, and for that we get a capacity payment. So that's how we'll help pay for that unit. With that, I think we're ready for questions. How much do you get from Neil for now? 
It's still eight megawatts, so we have the same amount of capacity. What's changed a lot since the early 2000s when I started my career in the utility world, um, that plant used to run at a 95% or higher load factor, which means 95% of the time it's delivering energy. Today our coal plants are in the 30 to 40, maybe 50% range. So it's become um, a lot more economically dispatched. Iowa, as everybody knows, has a lot of wind turbines and Mid-American um, is an investor or a builder of wind farms. So there's a lot of wind energy, which really dictates the price of energy in Iowa. So we still have the same percentage, we just get less energy from it. I, the Milford plant was going to cost so much more mm -hmm. than the Spencer plant. What is causing that increase? I mean, that's, I mean uh, prices are increasing everywhere, but there's no, no excuse, I think, for that kind of an increase. Inflation, um, the sign of the times, uh, fewer contractors, um, that's a real problem that we're seeing on the electric side of our house, electric transformers that we used to call the supplier and order them and have them in a couple weeks. We just got some in this week that we ordered last October, and they're substantially higher priced than they were five or 10 years ago. So um, industry-wide, there's a lot of inflationary pressures, um, fewer contractors, lots of things driving inflation. Somebody's making more money than they used to. I think a lot of people are probably making more money than they used to. That's why the stock market's where it's at, right? I'd like to thank Amanda and Steve for fa another fascinating and informative program about adding to the knowledge of our Spencer history. Uh, this coming Tuesday, again starting at 5.30, will be the final lecture series as the Spencer High School students that are part of No Boundaries will be sharing the research they have uncovered about the history of Spencer schools. You won't want to miss it. And thank you again. Please give them a warm. Thank you. Thank you.